So we're standing here uh, outside of the uh, observation bunker at the, the Point du Hoc, um, which wasn't obviously one of the first bunkers that the Germans built here. Uh, they started constructing the, the site here um, at the Point du Hoc in, in, fall, in the fall of 1942, November 1942. And uh, the Germans obviously gave priority first to their open gun emplacements, uh, dormitories, ammunition bunkers. Those were all built before the observation bunker was built, which was actually built in November 1943. So it was only a year after the Germans had started the construction of the Pointy Hawk that they actually built the, uh, the command post to the observation bunker here. Um, obviously, it was not just a bunker that was there for observation. It became the nerve center of the Pointy Hawk. It was the command post as well. Initially, officers had been uh, lodged in a farm near the access road that leads to the Pointy Hawk there. But obviously, with the, you know, the bombardments, uh, more and more uh, um, uh, aerial bombardments from the Allies, they'll decide to set up uh, that command post inside the observation bunker here. And uh, in all, there were nine German soldiers in here. The bunker was a, basically it was a standard bunker, what the Germans called a Regelbauten. It was like they had a catalog of bunkers and they could pick any type of bunker that they would use. So it was easy to build because they had these set models of bunkers. And this, this is the type of, that they used here at the Pony Hawker Regelbauten there. So we're going to have a look inside and uh, see what it looked like inside. So we're standing here at the entrance of the... Uh uh, observation bunker here at the Point du Hawk, and uh, as we mentioned earlier on, it's a Regelbauten, so it's a standard type uh, observation bunker, um, which means that uh, you know, the, the entrance to the bunker is always covered by one or several machine guns. Actually, here we have three. Um, we have the first one right here covering the entrance outside. There's another machine gun position inside as you walk down the steps, and there's another one on top. Uh, basically covering any approach towards the observation bunker in one of the Tobruks there, one of the uh, concrete positions on top of the, the bunker. Most of the, um, the, the rooms are inside of the bunker, but there's one room outside. Uh, it's, it's right here. Uh, this is actually the mess hall. Uh, the Germans had built this attachment to the standard uh, observation bunker. And this is where <coughs> they would have had you know, their meals. Uh, uh, although there are pictures as well that, uh, that exist of uh, Germans on top of the bunker um, having a beer uh, here in the, uh, in the spring of 1944. Um, but obviously they needed some protection, so we've got this uh, concrete, um, you know, rooms are protecting outside of the bunker um, where the Germans had their, their mess hall. So that's, uh, that's the only construction outside, which is sort of a, an, added, an added part of that observation bunker. All right, so we just walked down the steps into the, the bunker here, standing at the entrance of the, the observation post here. And we mentioned it was a standard type bunker, a Regelbauten, uh, not only in the way that it looked, um, but also in the way that it was built. And uh, we can actually see that when we look around, um, and you can figure out how the Germans built this thing. Uh, what they would do is initially they would, you know, they build the foundations, they would dig out the foundations, and then they would put, um, basically they put wooden framing. And the part of the wooden framing is still visible here. You can still see the wood. You, know, and still, uh, you can still see, you can still feel it. And then they would add the steel reinforcements, you know, which are also still visible. Because this was all reinforced concrete. So once the wooden framing was in place, once they had uh, added the, the steel reinforcements, then they would start pouring the concrete, right? Now you can clearly see here that they did that in layers. Uh, we can clearly see, you can see, see the grain of the wood and the concrete, and you can see that they actually poured it in layers. Um, they did it, obviously, to prevent air bubbles to form up in the concrete to make sure it was very solid and thick, solid and, and thick concrete here. So this is how we can see that how they built it, mainly, mainly built, rather, by, um, by uh, Organization Todd, so uh, a lot of French labor, there were some Russians and, and Italian POWs that, that worked here on the construction of the bunker as well. So it basically been pretty standard the way it was built and the way it had looked. Um, and uh, like all of these standard type bunkers, when you walk in and you come into the entrance, the first thing you'll see is a gas lock. Um, these, these type bunkers, these Regelbauten, they were all designed in the 1930s, you know, when the, when the French and the Germans were um, building their fortifications along the Siegfried Line and uh, the Maginot Line. And so, in those days, you know, there was still, there was still that, that, uh, a threat of gas, and, and, and it was still very present in, in the minds of the German and, and uh, French commanders. So, that's why we always had a gas lock here. Um, in certain cases, there was even a shower, so that in, in case of a gas attack, if the Germans were contaminated, they could still get rid of any residue before they would go into the bunker there. So this is where that would have been um, uh, at this uh, command post, this observation bunker. 
And then you would have an armored door um, right behind us there to get into the bunker before you would be able to get into the bunker. Now, although we we pointed out how well the Germans had built this bunker by like pouring the concrete in layers and reinforcing it, um, but there was a pretty thick steel door, armored door here, and you can still see the hinges here. Now, what's interesting is that we've got four hinges, and the reason for that is that uh, the door actually came in two parts. You had the bottom part and the top part. And that was because the Germans thought that if, you know, there would be a, a heavy bombardment that would uh, have a go at this concrete, if some of it would come down, would collapse, um, it would prevent the Germans from getting stuck inside, from being trapped inside. Because even if it blocked the door, you would still be able to open the top part of the door here. So as to prevent it from getting stuck. Although there was also an emergency exit that we'll see later on there. But that's sort of how the, uh, the entrance to a bunker looks with the, the gas lock, with the armored door, before you were actually able to go in. And obviously, uh, right uh, to our left here, the machine gun position covering the, the entrance there. They're going to actually close that. Um, you know, you'll probably see that there's quite a lot of damage. That's actually grenade damage. Um, so, you know, the Rangers uh, attacked uh, the bunker from two different sides and also from the rear. So that's some of that damage there. So the machine gun gunner could have fired, but he could also could have closed that little opening there to make sure that uh, no one could throw any grenades or uh, they could you know, actually lock themselves in inside there. So that's what it looks uh, here at the entrance, so we're going to have a look inside there. So here, um, you know, as we walk in, we pass that armored door, or pass the gas lock, and here we're in that other machine gun position that uh, um, that's also covering the entrance here. Um, so maybe have a look from the inside, where it looks from the inside out. Um, what's obviously interesting uh, here, uh, it's a small room, and you can imagine a German here with his MG, MG42 machine gun. Um, when you're firing that thing, Say, making a lot of noise, got the shell casings dropping. It would have been, you know, pretty, pretty impressive when you're firing a machine gun from inside here. Um, behind the German machine gunner, there would have been a power generator here. You know, the Germans are really worried about self-sufficiency of this bunker and to make sure they have power. And you know, uh, with the regular uh, aerial bombardments and with the actions of the resistance, they would regularly cut wires. Um, they wanted to make sure they had a power generator in here so they had power. Uh, inside the bunker here, and so that power generator was here and in this machine gun position. So this is the second machine gun position, and as we take a left here, there's another armored door, not as thick as the first one, but an armored door that would lead you to the barracks, this is the dormitory. That, as I said, uh, when we started, there's room in here for nine Germans, nine German soldiers, and um, you know, they could, they could stay here for several days, and they actually slept in this room. You know, they, uh, they slept in bunks, bunk beds, and um, they were attached to a wall here. You can still see part of the structure that has sustained the bunk beds against the wall. And so what would happen is, you know, if the Germans wanted a little bit more room and play cards here at a, at a table, a couple chairs that they had, uh, they would just leave the bunk beds against the wall. Uh, and once they would need them to go to sleep, they would lift the bunk bed. And the bunk beds were attached with metal chains to the ceiling here. You can still see the hooks where they would hook up their, their bong beds there. So there was room for nine guys in here. Um, you know, as we said, they had electricity, they had a power generator, so there were lights in here. They also had a stove. You know, obviously, as I said, they uh, started the construction here in, uh, in the fall of 1943, so they spent the rough winter of 1943-44 of uh, here. And so the stove you know, went out this way, and you would have had the stove right in the center here, so they could you know, warm up a little, they could, uh, they could cook or make some coffee, or, you know, so they had a really basically everything they needed. Although obviously it's not, not as comfortable uh, as you'd be in a, in a farm nearby where the Germans initially had their dormitories. But uh, obviously they thought of everything. It's also a room for the German soldiers to sleep. Um, and they had regular guard duties, obviously. Uh, it was continuously uh, one or two German soldiers that would be on guard. Uh, but they would uh, take shifts and they would sleep here. Right? So that's what the barracks um, look like. If you go back, see go back out. And we're going to go in this way into what probably is the largest room inside uh, the command post, an observation bunker here. This is what was the map room, or the operations room, basically. You would have had a, a large stable here uh, with lots of maps, you know, coordinates. This is obviously where the, the German officers would be. Um, 
this is you know where the nerve center was of the of the command of the command post and observation bunker. Um, all the coordinates, uh, all the information would be centralized here, and then uh, obviously it ought to be given to fire and, and adjust ranges and, and coordinates there. So this is really a very important part of the bunker here. But obviously, a lot of the information uh, that the officers were getting, uh, they were getting from uh, you know, the ob visual observation and also from radio and uh, telephone communications. And the radio and telephone communications were right over here. There's the two small rooms. Um, basically, uh, over on this side, you had the uh, telephone communications. Over on that side, radio. Um, so basically, they could communicate by telephone. But again, the problem was there. The, the wires would sometimes get cut, cut, and so you know they also had a radio room. Although apparently, a lot of the radio equipment that they used was to actually pick up radio messages and signals from out on the channel. Uh, if there would be an enemy approaching, they would be able to pick that up, or any messages uh, they could be able to pick that up over here. And so a lot of the information that they got, apart from the visual observation they had, would come in through here. Uh, this is also where they would uh, communicate to the gunners over at the open gun emplacements or gun casements, and then initially, as we know on D-Day, uh, to the gunners all the way behind the coastal road because the guns had been moved behind the, the road there. Now communication with the uh, with the gunners over at the coastal road wasn't very good as we know when the rangers and Lynn Lamell and uh, Jack Coon got to the guns they didn't find any sentries and no gunners over at the guns there and uh, from accounts that we have from German soldiers that were here in the observation bunker apparently through the radio communications that they had those guys were drunk they were drunk as hell and so you know they uh, basically what they got from them was like you know the hell with it we're out of here and so they had apparently uh, we've got having a go at all the Calvados and uh, we're up for a fight. So um, these guys must have been pretty uh, uh, upset to put it uh, that way when they found out that there was nobody really over at the guns there that could fire them there. Um, you know, again, it would be like 24-hour duty. So you know, you would have uh, a separate room here over to this side. Uh, where there was room for the radio and telephone operator um, to get some sleep. Again, same same idea as over in the other room there, the barracks room. You would have the bunk beds here, uh, so they would be able to you know take shifts and uh, um, and uh, get some sleep from time to time. Um, but basically, it was a 24-hour uh, job that they had here at the at the command post. And so this is where communications took place. We had the map rooms right next there, and so the only things left is obviously uh, the visual observation that they had here in the uh, observation post, and that's over back behind us. So we're going to have a, a look at probably what's the most impressive part of the bunker. And here you see another uh, nice example of one of those armored doors. You know. Barracks room over there, and all these armored doors, and you know, the double lock on it. Um, and actually, on D Day, when the Rangers attacked the observation post, they attacked it from two different sides. Um, there was a group that attacked it from the front. They actually threw several grenades through the observation slip there. They threw four to three, actually um, uh, fell inside the bunker and exploded, and uh, the Germans were momentarily silenced here. They, uh, but they did receive, after that, more small arms fire from the Germans, so they brought in a bazooka, and uh, they actually fired a bazooka rocket. The first rocket bounced off the top of the observation bunker, and the second one actually went right through the opening, and uh, there was a lot of smoke, and apparently what happened then uh, the Germans basically, they, they locked themselves in and they locked it, they barricaded it from the inside. So they locked all this, to made sure that no rangers could get in from the observation uh, part of the bunker to, into the map room here. And they, all, we already seen the entrance over on that side. So they actually were, were locked in here. And uh, from what we know, they, they stayed here until all of their ammunition, they're firing their machine guns. And then uh, opened the, uh, the, um, the main entrance and came out with a white flag and were, were taken prisoner. Um, accounts differ a little bit from the German side to the American side as to when exactly the Germans surrendered and how many Germans actually came out of the bunker. Um, but we believe that there were nine Germans in here. Uh, the Rangers claim that they captured eight that actually were in this bunker and there was one man, one German soldier that was killed here. Um, so that's what we believe it happened. Basically the Germans in the end realized, well, we're stuck in here, we're going we're gonna to give it a call of a day and uh, they surrendered here. So that's, a, that's what basically what they the last few hours they spent were probably in, in here, um, you know, trying to figure out what they were going to do, and then they, they decided to surrender. And so, as we open the armored door again, we're going to go up these steps and uh, have a look at 
this part, the final part of the observation post. And this obviously uh, is, uh, is probably one of the highlights for people who visit uh, the observation bunker here. Uh, you know, the visual observation that we have here of the channel uh, speaks to the imagination of a lot of our visitors, especially those who've seen the longest day and who remember a major Werner plus cat and seeing all those thousands of ships at the horizon. Um, a major Warner Plus guy wasn't here, it was over at Omaha Beach, but they filmed it in a similar type observation bunker over in the British sector in a battery called Long Sermere. But it's pretty much probably what the, what the Germans saw here on the morning of the 6th they looked through the opening here of the, of the observation bunker here. Um, now, what's interesting is that um, you know, when they, when they built this, this, this bunker uh, in 1943, late 1943, um, a few things happened um, that actually demoralized the Germans who were here uh, in, uh, in, in 1944. The first thing that happened was um, several um, you know, Allied planes had already flown over the Pointy Hawk. There had been one attack by uh, a fighter bomber um, that killed one of the Germans uh, in the spring of 1943, actually the first German who was killed here. And um, uh, in October 1943, they actually spotted out there in the channel uh, two, three small dots, and they were actually small German, uh, which, or rather small um, uh, Allied patrol boats. And uh, when they spotted them, you know, Germans sort of panicked a little bit, didn't really know how to react. The, 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 the boats were small, they were very far out. And uh, so basically the, the, uh, the battery commander, uh, Lieutenant Aveling, he decided not to fire uh, at those small craft, small PT boats. And so um, a few days later, actually that cost him his job because uh, uh, the major in command of the, uh, the artillery regiment uh, called up Aveling to tell him, why the hell didn't you fire at those ships there? He said, well, sir, they were too far out, and we're never going to hit them. And he said, well, you should have fired at them anyway. And so, in the end, Aveling was fired. Two days later, he was sent to the Eastern Front, uh, disciplining measure. Now, the men here adored Aveling. You know, he, he, was, uh, he was very popular with the men, and so it affected their morale that Aveling, you know, left the, the battery. And that was the first thing that happened that sort of affected their morale. Um, the second thing that happened uh, was the fact that um, the soldiers that were arriving here, late 43, early 44, a lot of them were a lot older uh, than, the, than the, uh, the soldiers who were initially. Um, guys between 30 or 40, there were even a few guys that were in their 50s. And for the younger guy, guys who stayed here, um, for them it was really tough to, to, to be there with these guys because they were all family uh, and, 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 and they would talk about their families and they had a lot of homesickness and so obviously it affected everyone else in the, uh, in the, the battery the, on the command post. So there was a morale uh, factor there as well. And the next thing that affected morale was the winter of 43-44. It was a very cold winter here of the Pony Hawk. Got a lot of winds. Uh, you get, you know, it can, it can, it can uh, winds up to 90 kilometers per hour. And it was cold, and so obviously that also affected morale. And then as 44 started, you know, the, the first bombardments, real heavy bombardments, in the spring of 1944.